y'all. You ready for another road rambling? Road rambling. Hey, I'm the Blue Bodhi. Um, Bodhi for short. I am a spiritual educator, professional folk magic practitioner, healer, etc., etc. Astrologer, palm reader, extraordinaire. Anyway, what's up? So. I'm on my way back from Dallas. This is actually my second road rambling of the day, but chances are I didn't release this on the same day. Anyway, we're going to talk about something different because as I was in the middle of my other road rambling, yeah, I took my hands off the wheel, don't tell nobody. Uh, as I was in the middle of my other road rambling, I thought about something else, okay? Because I talked about my bout with meningitis when I was 19. I talked about, you know, dying. I talked about, you know, being thankful, blah, 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 blah. What I realized is a lot of you guys have asked me repeatedly to talk about what I saw when I died. So let's talk about that as we're going 83 miles an hour down the highway. All right, here we go. So when I was 19, I was on a family, little small family vacation. My mom, my sister, and my sister's friend. And we were over in Missouri um, at our cabin. We went to Silver Dollar City. And while we were at Silver Dollar City, like later in that afternoon, I started getting a really bad headache, okay? Of course, it was hot. It's summertime, it's hot. So I'm probably dehydrated, right? No big deal. Well, it got so bad, we ended up like going home, but we had really, we'd been there all day anyway. So, you know, I'm all right with that. So we ended up going home, back to the cabin, where the headache proceeded to get worse. And then it got into me getting sick, nauseated, throwing up. Wasn't holding anything down. So there's not really a hospital anywhere by there, okay? My mom, we just decided to go home. It's four hours. My mom stopped, and when she got gas, she got me a Dramamine. I got the Dramamine down, and I think I slept the whole way. Like, I don't really remember. I mean, I, I think I remember waking up, like, once or something like that, maybe to throw up. But I don't really remember the drive, okay? I only, from this point, remember spotty things until two specific times and then me waking up, okay? Okay. So I'm going to tell you what I remember, and I'm going to start with this. Meningitis, the headache from meningitis, is one of the worst pains you could experience. So if you guys don't know what meningitis is, meningitis is a bacteria, a virus, etc. that gets in your fluid around your brain. It causes your brain to swell. Well, you got a skull. So, where's it going to go? Nowhere is the answer. So, that pressure of your brain swelling and pushing against your skull is intense. There's nothing that I have experienced. I've had two C-sections. I've had broken hips. I've had, like, I, I've had a lot of shit. Have chronic migraines like things like that there is nothing that I've experienced or that I can tell you that is like the pain of this particular headache it is that bad so now when I have to go anywhere and they you know the hospital or anything like that like what's your pain level never in my life will I say 10 unless it's that type of headache never that's a 10 that's an, I'm going to pass out because the pain is so fucking bad. I cannot bear to live anymore. It hurts that bad. Just let me die. It makes you so ill that you, it, you black out. Like you literally lose parts of your memory. Like it's, it's that bad. If any of y'all have ever had a spinal tap, spinal taps hurt like a motherfucker. I've had one awake, but I had one during this. I didn't even feel it. I mean, I did, but it was like getting an IV. 
So we get back to Tulsa. We get to Sand Springs, which is where my grandparents live. So we get to my grandparents' house. The only thing I remember is crawling into the back of my grandparents' car. I don't remember getting out of my mom's truck. I don't remember walking to, I don't remember anything. But I remember myself crawling into the back of my grandparents' car because I saw myself from up here, like out of body kind of thing. And I remember feeling like, you know, the velour, velvet, whatever, cushy seats, okay? I remember how maroon they looked. And I remember that feel, like I, right now, I can still feel them under my fingertips. I remember my grandpa standing there. I was grandpa's girl, okay? I remember my grandpa standing there, and that's it. I do not remember the ride to the hospital. The other part that I remember is sitting in the waiting room. And my mom is here, and my grandpa is here, and my mom's holding me up, and I'm trying not to throw up. Like, even talking about it makes me want to throw up. I'm trying not to throw up. And I remember my mom being angry because the lady behind the counter wouldn't listen to her. And the lady was like, have a seat. If she's walking in, she's fine. And I don't know how long it was between this and the next part. The next part I remember is there was a doctor, they were doing some construction at the hospital and so he was cutting through the thing. Like we literally were the only people in the waiting room. There may have been one other person, but we were the only people in the waiting room that I remember, okay? There was an emergency room doctor, he came out over here and he walked across and he got to the door and he started to put his push his button in and he paused and I know that he turned around, he came over, he knelt down in front of me and I remember him looking in my eyes and stuff like that and he turned around and like yelled to the lady behind the counter, I'm taking her to room blah 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 right now and she was like, well I don't have blah blah and he, she started to argue with him and he said, now. I remember the next thing I remember is them telling me to hold on to the bar of the bed because they were going to do a spinal tap and then I had to curl my back right and I remember feeling the needle and I remember they had to poke three times to find the spinal fluid and the next thing I know I'm in the corner of the room now, when I say I'm in the corner of the room, this was a weird corner of the room. Because this is a normal ER hospital room, okay? So the ceiling's what, like maybe seven feet, eight feet, maybe 10, I don't know. Normal hospital in the 90s, okay? Not vaulted ceilings. Yet it was like I was at a vaulted ceiling and I kind of was like sucked up like that. And I'm looking down at this seat. And I see there are four people standing behind me, interns that are watching. There's two girls. One has long straight brown hair. The other one had blonde hair. Then there was a, an Indian man standing there. And then there was a young man who I really could only see part of his face here. He had really curly hair. But I focused on his shoes for some reason. And I just knew that those were brand new shoes that he had just got. He was glad he got them. They were kind of a dusty turquoise New Balance. And that he was so glad because of all the standing he was doing as an intern. And there was a tile he was standing on that had a crack across the corner. And I looked at the tile and I was like, oh man, that's the one that charge nurse is really pissed about because this is a brand new tile. Blah, blah. And I'm focusing on those things. And then I realize like they are scrambling around the person in the bed. I see them jerk the needle out. I see them flip me over. I see them start working on me and I'm not there anymore. As soon as I realize, oh, that's me. That's me. Like I had that, mo like, oh shit. And then I was not there. I didn't feel the headache anymore. I didn't feel any pain. I didn't, nothing. Just that epiphany like, oh fuck. And I wasn't there anymore. Where I was, was in a bubble. So, I'm going to try to words this as best I can, but I don't really think there are any words for this, okay? In this bubble, and I don't know how long I was gone. 
I don't. My mom is not here, so I can't ask her. She, I don't know if she knows anyway. Like the hospital records, they probably don't even have them, but I don't know. I just know I was gone. They explained it to me later that I died in the ER. They explained it to me that my fever reached 106.1, that the swelling was so severe they considered opening my skull. And before I had had the spinal tap, they had been giving me everything they could possibly give me. They were doing the spinal tap to try to figure out what type of meningitis I had. Because I guess there's other, th I don't know how they figured, they just, they just started throwing everything at me that they could. They pumped me full of some pain medicine. They pumped me full of antibiotics. I was told that I had the highest dose of antibiotics that they could give a person just to try to save my life. Because they had no idea what the fuck was meningitis I had. In this bubble, I'm in water up to about here. Okay. Now, I'm short. I'm like 5'4". At this time, I weighed maybe 115 pounds, okay? I'm, I'm not a big person. I'm in water up to here. And I use the term water loosely. Because it wasn't really water. It was like paint and oil at the same time. And I'm in this bubble of color, and it's just these vibrant, beautiful colors. And I kind of am looking around, and the only thing I can say, this is how, the only way I can explain it, is that if you took every color you have ever seen in your life, and some you haven't seen, like there's not even a, a, a word for the color, and you put them together as like paint, but flowing like oil. And they're just backlit, illuminated. And it's like watching molten stained glass. And I remember that it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. And the water, the liquid was like that as well. And as I'm paying attention, I realize there are two beings in front of me. One a bit taller, maybe seven foot tall or so, and one about six foot. One's a little wider, one's very thin. I couldn't see a face. I couldn't see anything like that. Um, it was just beautiful. I couldn't see features, just the shape of the person, the, the being. And as soon as I noticed them, it's like I knew that they smiled, but I don't know how I know that they smiled. And in that moment, I felt every emotion I've ever felt in my life at the same time in a split second. Every amazing thing, every horrible thing, everything I have never experienced, hadn't experienced yet, in a split second. I didn't see my life flash before my eyes. It was just color and emotion. Now, like I said, I don't know how long I was gone. Okay. To me, that whole experience of the bubble, of the color, of the beings, of the emotion, was less than five seconds. waking up in ICU and I know that my wrist is on fire and I, I kind of I realize I have wires and plugs all over me and I'm like what you know what the fuck is this you know so I look down and I have an IV right here in this uh, this you know vein or whatever and it's burning it tends burning so I hit the button Nobody answers on that. So I hit the button again. And this nurse is like, uh, hello? And I was like, my, my wrist really hurts. And she says, who is this? And I said, my wrist hurts. And I'm going to pull this out. And next.
next thing I know, there are two nurses in my room. There's one over here, and she's looking at this, and she is pulling it out because my vein had collapsed because they were giving me so much stuff to try to keep me alive. My vein collapsed to try to save my life, I guess I should say. And up here is this other nurse. So the one over here, she's kind of a thinner lady. I didn't really see her face. Like, I don't really remember her face, okay? I just know that she had her hair pulled back in a bun, like kind of light brown hair. But I remember the lady up here because I loved me some Drop Dead Fred. And she reminded me of the lady, the nurse on Drop Dead Fred. And I looked up at her. I remember kind of rolling my eyes up and looking at her. And I said, oh. Like, I tried to channel Drop Dead Fred because I'm trying to be funny. I'm like, you're a big lady. And I hear, beep, and I'm gone. This time I was instantly somewhere else. I didn't get to stay in the room. I didn't get to see what happened. I'm instantly somewhere else. Now I flatlined. garden is stretching out before me and it's just one of the most beautiful peaceful places I have ever experienced in my life. I've never experienced anything like it since. And I kind of looking around and there's people everywhere. Some of them are like sitting reading. Some of them are looking up at the trees because the trees all have flowers and stuff on them. Like it, it, I can't even describe how beautiful it is with words. Trees I've never seen were there. Trees that I know like the back of my hand were there. Some people are reading. Some people are walking around. Some people are, you know, talking to other people, etc. And then I realize there's a fountain in the middle of this garden. And there are people standing around the fountain. Now I'm curious. Because they're all looking in the fountain. Some of them are smiling. Some of them are crying. Some of them are smiling and crying. Some of them have this worried look on their face. I'm like, what's in the fountain? You know, like, what's in the box? What's in the fountain? And then I realize there's a being standing next to me right here. I maybe came up to here on this being. So they're, they're at least 8 to 10 feet tall, I would say. Because they were very elongated. The front is white. The back is black. Like literally half and half. Kind of a little fade in between, but half and half. No features. I knew it was a him. But that's it. And I realized there's, that he's standing there next to me. Okay. And I remember kind of just like slightly looking over the corner of my eye. And I looked back at the fountain. And I could feel that he was amused by, because I'm like, I'm going to go look at the fountain. And I remember knowing that he was amused by that. He was kind of like, So I started trying to push forward because I wanted to go look in the fountain. So I started trying to push forward and I remember him being amused by that. And I couldn't move. I couldn't move. Like I could just barely lean just like a little big. And I was getting frustrated because I'm going to go look in the fountain. I'm a Capricorn and you don't tell a Capricorn what they cannot do. <laughs> It's like a surefire way to get them to do it. So it was like the more I was told or felt or held back that I couldn't go look in the fountain, the more I wanted to look in the fucking fountain. So I'm pushing with everything I fucking have. And he's kind of amused by this. Okay? After a moment, I moved my leg moved my right leg a step forward and the feel of surprise from this being was palpable to the point that he put a hand on my shoulder it was surprise and a little fear like oh no he put a hand on my shoulder now 
when he put the hand on my shoulder, we talk about downloads all the time, okay? But this hand on my shoulder was such a download. And I will tell you kind of what I was told, shown. Shown, told, whatever. I will, I'll tell you. Okay. That it paused me in my tracks. I, I Now, as I... I've, it, it took me long to process, and we'll talk about that too. Now, I... I don't, I feel like he was not supposed to touch me, okay? I feel like that wasn't supposed to be a thing. But I also know that I was not supposed to look in said fountain. And when I moved my leg, it was like, oh shit. He had to stop me from doing that somehow, okay? Now, his hand on my shoulder was, to me, a split second. And literally, I remember jerking back and like epiphany, like just bam, all this shit just instantly in my head. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up in a hospital bed. And my mom's on one side and there's a doctor, a really tall, thin, elegant looking man, glasses, beautifully combed, gray, gray pepper, gray salt pepper hair and he goes there she is and he patted my arm three times and I remember green 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 and I said oh you're green because I remember because I was like it was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen and he said what and I said oh you're green and he kind of looked he's like okay sweetie he's like do you know where you are proceeded to talk about what had happened, you know, they, they made sure I was coherent, that I could wake up here, etc. And I learned that I had been in a medically induced coma for a week and a half. I was asked if I remembered my mom talking to me, if I remember anybody talking to me, and I was like, no, and no. So, of course, I found out the man that was there was the neurologist that had basically saved my life. I found out that I had bacterial meningitis and that they were never able to actually pinpoint what bacteria it was. So, they gave me everything they could think to give me and then some to try and save my life. And it worked. I went through all kinds of physical therapy and so on to make sure my body worked, that I didn't have any brain damage. Like, I went through all kinds of stuff, okay? They were just flabbergasted that, A, I didn't appear to have any brain damage, and B, I could walk, I could move. Like, they, they were amazed. They, had, they were like, holy fuck, like... And so, when I went a couple weeks later to visit the neurologist, he asked me about being in the coma and what I had seen, what I had heard, etc. And I told him about the emergency room, the bubble, and I told him about the garden. And he was fascinated. Asked me a bunch of questions, we sat and talked for a little bit, and then he was the only person that I told the full thing to. Because I tried to tell my mom, I tried to tell a couple other people, like friends, and they were kind of like, wow, that was a really good coma dream. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. The neurologist didn't think it was a coma dream. He wanted to talk about it because he told me what I had had was a near-death experience. That, you know, I had physically died in the ER, that they had to bring me back. That I had physically died in ICU and they had to bring me back. In fact, in ICU, I actually had flatlined for over a minute and a half. Like they were actually worried. They were getting worried. Now in the ER, I had only flatlined for about 30 seconds. So he was fascinated with what I saw. I never got the chance to tell him what I was told with the hand on my shoulder. I saw him a couple more times and as you know he's doing the checkup we're talking and stuff and then he retired. 
push it down and just not think about it because if I ever brought it up to anybody, they, you know, they give you that smile like, oh, honey, oh, they give you that smile like, oh, here they go on their crazy rant again. harder than dying it is it is ego death is 100 percent. sorry i hit a red light all of a sudden ego death is 100 percent harder than actually dying because with ego death you have to face the fact that what you are doing right at that moment and i will tell you about my experience with that too what you're doing in that moment is how you are going to die this is how your friends, your family, your kids are going to know that you died. You have to mentally go, I am going to die. You have to come to terms with it and you have to be okay with it. You have to accept it. Your body, your mind, your mind will fight that like nobody's fucking business. Your mind will fight ego death. You will struggle with yourself, with your ego. I cannot even explain it to you. It is horrendous and fantastical. Because when you finally go, it's okay. It's okay. I've had a good life. I'm going to die. It's okay. My kids will be okay. My family will be okay. It's okay. When you finally go, it's okay, and you let go, and you accept it, it's over. But you are changed. But we're going to talk about ego death in a minute, okay? 
ego death is 100% harder than actually dying, y'all. So, I'm doing this project and I come across this subreddit, reddit, whatever, about NDEs. I'm like, the fuck is an NDE? So I open the thing and I start reading that this is a uh, a part of Reddit where some people in England, and please forgive me because I don't remember right off the top of my head, some neurologists, some you know researchers, etc., have been studying people that have died and been brought back to life, a near death experience, and they have found that every single person. No matter their cultural background, no matter their beliefs, no matter where they come from in the world, all had an experience that fit into one of like four or five categories. I think it's four, but I could be wrong. Four or five categories. Every one of them. Now, if you guys want to know more about this, there is a show on Netflix called Surviving Death. And the very first episode talks about this and it talks about these categories. It also talks about something that they talked about in this Reddit page. Now, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, when I found this Reddit page and I started reading about people's experiences, I was like, holy fuck. And then I came across one that was the bubble that was exactly like what I experienced. And I had this moment where I, I instantly cried. I instantly cried. Because when I started reading the comments, there was like 152 comments with the same experience. Like I almost want to cry now with the same experience. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't crazy. And if I was crazy, all these other people were crazy. So we could all have matching grippy socks. And then a little further down, I came to another post where someone, because they asked for people to share their experiences. And so I came to another post where someone had had the, vi the vision of a garden. Their garden was slightly different. The being they were talking to was slightly different. And here are the tears again, because oh my God, I'm not crazy. <laughs> comments on the bottom of that one there were 300 something on the bottom of that one and you bet I read every fucking one and I liked every fucking one I was up for like five hours because I was doing this research like 11 o'clock at night the next thing I know it's like three four o'clock in the morning and I'm like oh fuck I better go to bed like I gotta get up get the kids to school in like two hours and I realized I wasn't crazy. I wasn't alone. So I filled out their form and I put my comment on there. Here's what I experienced. I commented on the two that were like mine and I had one of them reach out to me. I documented my experience for them or sent it in for their documentation. I cannot tell you guys the weight that lifted off my chest. Holding that inside for so long, for so long, and I want to say that this was like 2012 or 2013, for, I held this in for almost 15 years. I can't tell you how freeing that was, how justified I felt finally. everyone 
humans think time is a thing. This is why I loved the episode in The Good Place where they talked about Jeremy Veramy. Whoever wrote that is pretty spot on in a way. That time loops and twists and folds and bends and disconnects and is time is not a linear thing. Time is like a cylinder. It's like a Tesla coil with the, you know, the ball at the top with the electricity that comes out that we always love to, you know, like put our hands on, our hair stands up, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's like that, but it's like a cylinder. And those electric things go every which way. Time goes every which way. So all the theories about space-time are correct and incorrect at the same time. I don't think that human brains are ever truly meant to understand how space-time works in the capacity that the human brain is now. Maybe several hundred years in the future, maybe. But I don't believe that our human brains are able to comprehend because we live in this 3D world. Time is not 3D. Time is every D. All the Ds. That sounded really bad. I digress. Time is not normal time. Time is a human construct. The second big thing that right there floored me. The second thing is this. We, our souls, operate in cycles. The earth, our life right now, is like school. You have to go from kindergarten to 12th grade. Every life, every year, there is something that you have to accomplish. If you look at your lives like years in school, there is something, several things you have to accomplish, you have to learn, you have to overcome. And you have like a checklist, right? Everybody has a vacation life. Everybody has a life where you are never born. Whether you die in the womb, whether you're aborted, whether your mother is killed, something like that. Everybody has that life. Everybody has a life where they die as a child. Everybody has a, several lives where they die as a child. Everybody has lives where they die horrendously. Everybody has lives where they die after they've lived a very long life surrounded by friends. Everybody has to experience catastrophic loss. Everybody has to experience ultimate love. Everybody has to experience everything because this is like school. It is school. Now, some people, when they, you know, they, they, they're like, I want all the good things up front. Like, I want all the good things up front. And they say the worst for last. And then they're like, God damn, my life is horrible. Like, everything is horrible. Because you still got to do all the things. And if you got to repeat a couple grades because you didn't want to do the things, then you got to repeat the fucking grades. And then some people, when they, when they graduate, they're like, and I'm done. I'm out. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Then there are people that come back and get an associate's degree. They get a bachelor. Some people get a master. Some people are dumb and get doctorates. <laughs> some people are really dumb and they get multiple doctorates. I say really dumb, but you, you know what I'm saying. They come back and they, they get multiple doctorates. This is where transcendence comes from. This is where enlightenment nirvana comes from. This is where the term bodhisattva comes from. In Buddhism, a bodhisattva is someone who gives up their own enlightenment to help others reach their enlightenment. That's the short of it. Go Google it, research a little bit. With this school, is a cycle. Every year is a cycle. Every life is a cycle. And it is a wheel. 
it is a wheel. Up here, you're alive. You choose the life you're in. When you pass away, you get debriefed. Excuse all the bumpies, I'm going through a town in Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is not known for good roads. When you die, you get debriefed, and then you're here when you finish your debriefing. Now, sometimes this debriefing is very quickly. Sometimes it takes a long time. And then you are a guide for someone else. You are a sign to someone. Now, even when we're a guide for someone else, we have things we have to learn, we have to process, we have to accomplish. Maybe we need to help this person overcome it so we can over, whatever it is, okay? There's still things you have to do, accomplish, etc. as a guide when you're not physically here. You are here, but you're not here. We're going to talk about that too in a minute. Hopefully I remember all these things I say. We're going to talk about that too. So, you have all these things that you still have to accomplish. This is why, and I've had to tell people this repeatedly, and I know it's not popular opinion. I've heard a few other people who have experienced near-death experiences and have come back with information, with knowledge, say the same thing. Not all spirit guides are for your best good. Some of them have to learn fucking lessons too. Not all spirit guides are working in your highest good. Okay? They're technically just people. So, you help, you get briefed on that person's life. You're with that person while they're alive. And when they die, you get debriefed again. What did you learn? What did they learn? What did you accomplish? Blah, 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 blah. And then, once that debriefing is over, you pick your next life and you start over. It's a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. There's a cute little pug dog tail over there. Sorry. It's a cycle. Until you accomplish everything on your checklist that your soul has to accomplish. Now, with time not really being time, with time not being linear, there are some times that you're going to have a past life that's way in the future. Because you needed to learn those things, accomplish those things before this back here. This is why, in my opinion now, we have some things that are so advanced. That's like, where the fuck did this come from? This is so advanced. Because that person's soul needed to go and learn these things and unlock whatever it is in their new human brain to unlock to now have this technology because it had to happen. Everything happens for a reason and we are not ever privy to know what those reasons are. Now, some of the other things that I learned, etc. Some of them are gifts. I'm going to consider them gifts because they are. Every single person that has experienced a near-death experience is, they come back with a gift. I highly, highly encourage you guys to watch that first episode at least of Surviving Death. There are people that come back with fantastic musical skills, with artistic abilities. I came back with multiple forms of synesthesia. Now, this is technically because of the brain damage. Because even though I'm okay, even though I'm alive, even though I'm an awesome person, I still have a little bit of brain damage. You cannot squish a brain to that level and not have something. So synesthesia is where multiple senses overlap, where they work at the same time. So instead of me just hearing music and going, oh, that's a beautiful melody, and instead of me just hearing it with my ears, I actually see it with my eyeballs. It's like wearing bifocals. Mine works like bifocals, okay? So it's right here. Now at first, it fucked me up. I think I've kind of always had a form of it because I played the trumpet all through school. I almost always had perfect pitch. I could learn music like that because I could see where the music needed to sit to be correct. I don't really remember it having colors, but I could see where the music had to sit to be correct, where the note had to sit to be correct. So I knew if a note was off 
out of tone, out of tune, because it was wrong. It sat wrong. So, now suddenly I see the music. I see the sounds. Every sound is a color or a pattern. Some things are patterns. Music becomes a pattern because you have every instrument is a different color. Singers' voices are all different colors. The music forms together like a pattern. I started painting those patterns. I also, now this has gotten stronger as I've got older and as I've used it more, okay? I also can touch things and they're a color. As in green, green, green. I also have another form where letters or colors. Some of them are textures. Some of them have smells. Same with numbers. Not all, but some. And they all have to sit in a certain space in my brain, okay? Now, I did not know what synesthesia was or, or and, I didn't know that everyone couldn't do this. I thought everyone saw colors in sound. I thought everyone saw colors when they touched things. I thought the letter A was red to everyone. The number three was red to everyone. The number four is blue, five is orange, and three is fuzzy, nine is yellow and fuzzy and has this weird like moldy film on it. I don't know, I thought that everybody saw that shit. I was wrong. I didn't know until 2020 until 2020 and the only reason I found out in 2020 is that I had a friend take me to the symphony in Tulsa I played in multiple symphonies like I was yeah I loved band I was a massive band nerd so I had played in multiple concerts and things like that I had never gone to one so I'm sitting there and take my phone out and I start sketching you know on the sketch pad and my friend looks over and he's like what are you doing and I said, I'm, I'm drawing the symphony. And he sat there watching me for a minute. He said, well, explain. So I have one that I've turned into an art piece. It's, it's still in my home. I just can't sell it for some reason. It's got this interesting gray background, but it's not gray. It's black. It's grays, whites, and blacks, but it's gray. And then there's a black swatch. There's a white swatch with some black in it and a big red swatch. And I was like, well, the red is the piano. The white with the little bits of black in it are the violas, violins, the piccolos, the higher pitch sounds, and the black is the bass and the oboe and all the deeper pitch sounds, but those things are the forefront, and I said everything else in the back kind of blends together in this beautiful gray. And he said, oh, you have synesthesia. I was like, I had a Buddha, what? He's like, you have synesthesia. I was like, oh, okay. He was like, you don't know this? And I was like, no. So then he asked me to go through and show him some of the other things I had sketched, okay? And he was like, oh yeah. He's like, you have synesthesia. All right. And then I, and then it hit me. I'm like, you, you're like, you see that, right? He was like, no. So now I'm like, okay, let me shut up because the fuck, is, what is going on? So I literally had to go home and Google synesthesia. And I was ecstatic and saddened at the same time. It instantly made me sad because I found out that not everybody sees color in music and in voices and in sounds and touches things and they're like, I found that out. And I actually cried. Like I still wanna cry. And then at the same time, I'm like, oh God, my brain is broke un, broke un. <laughs> because I have multiple forms of it. Chromesthesia, which is seeing color in sound, is one of the more common, okay? It's estimated, and this was the last time I Googled it, okay, that only about 5 to 7% of the population has synesthesia. My nose ring is weird. All right. 
only about five to seven percent now they think that this might be higher because there's a lot of people like me i didn't know i had it now they think this might be higher just because people don't know okay but chromesthesia and spatial sequence and i probably just murdered that sequence synesthesia are two of the most common the spatial sequence is where numbers letters have to sit in a certain space like they don't just sit linear on a page when you see them they float it's like four goes up here three always goes here nine always goes you know what i mean like things like that okay those are the most common grapheme is another one uh, a grapheme is where they sit so anyway sorry google you can google all this because my brain's like blah, blah, blah. well then i found out that touching and seeing color is one of the there's only one form of synesthesia rarer than that and i don't remember what that is so please please forgive me but only two less than two percent is like 1.3 percent of those people with synesthesia have tactile visual synesthesia like it's that rare too as in whatever the bubble of color was is part of the synesthesia now the other thing is this I've always been an artist I've always been artistic even when I was like grade school like I was that kid who my art pieces in grade school ended up in the principal's office I won all these things okay but it was for more realism than anything when I was in high school, junior high, excuse me, I didn't take art in high school. When I was in, in junior high, I could do realism that was amazing. Like, I impressed myself a few times. Like, holy fuck, that came out of my hands, you know? After meningitis, I can't do realism at all. Not even tracing it. Like, I can trace it. But it, my brain literally shorts out and goes, no ma'am, this is not how, no ma'am, this is not as look. Abstract, however. I got you. In fact, because of the type of epilepsy that I developed, which is temporal lobe epilepsy, is what I developed from the, the meningitis. It makes you obsessively creative. Mine is on the left side is where it starts and goes over. It makes you obsessively creative. So I have had times where I've had heightened activity before I really was diagnosed and on, you know, they put me on different meds and stuff like that to try to fix it. Um, where I had a really bad, one of the worst is I had a really, really bad Thursday. It was storming, it was horrible. And so Friday I woke up, I took my kids to school and I had this burning need to paint like if I did not paint this weekend I was I was probably gonna die like it was it was very weird and it was that level of oh my god I have to paint right now okay took them to school I went to Walmart I went to Hobby Lobby I went to Walmart and I got all of this um, mud like you know drywall drywall mud. I went to Hobby Lobby I bought I filled the back of an SUV with canvases. I spent like probably $400 on canvases. I bought tons of paint at both places. I get home because I had told my husband at the time, like, hey, I'm going to go get some canvases and some paint. Because I used to paint all the time. Like, I started, I actually didn't paint until I started painting again in like 2003. I was oil painting. I did some fantastic pieces. And I had a guy that I was dating at the time that told me that, you know, it was, they weren't very good. And I, I stopped. I didn't paint anymore until 2013. And then I just got this need to paint, right? So in 2016, I had this episode where, like, I got home and my, my husband at the time was like, excuse you, what is this? I, we had a two-car garage. And I had kind of a makeshift studio out there. I went out in the garage. And between Friday and Sunday night... I didn't hardly sleep. I didn't hardly eat. All I did was listen to music and paint. And I mean like symphonies and paint. And I painted 40, 42 or 45 pieces. I can't remember. They ranged from 8 
by tens to four foot by four foot canvases. All of them were sculpted. I came up with that Friday morning and made my own gesso that was thick enough I could sculpt. And at the time I was going back to OSU to finish my degree and I had a couple art classes. Well, that next Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever my art class was, I went in and the teacher was like, he was my age because I was like the oldest student in that class. And he was like, what are we doing this weekend? Blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh, I painted. He was like, oh, I'd love to see some of your paintings. So the next class, I just took some pictures and I took them in and he was like, these are phenomenal. Would you bring one to class? I want to see it because I told him they were sculpted and that I had sealed them so you could touch them because I wanted to touch the symphony to touch the color so when I was painting it and when I was sculpting it the sculpting was the same color to me as the color I was seeing so I could touch the symphony so I brought a couple to class and he was just like oh my god and everybody looked at him and so on and I'm just like I'm uncomfortable with this okay well ended up offering me, like I entered a couple in the, he asked me to enter a couple in the student art show, like the juried art show. So I did, I entered a couple and one of them won second place. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? Like I get kind of, like kind of teary. So anyway, because I got second place, I was offered a solo gallery show there at the student union display area. So I put pieces from that weekend and we called it Seized. It's all epilepsy art. I've had my pieces in a couple of uh, migraine magazines, epileptic magazines, etc. There are people that have come back with photographic memories. There are people that have come back with amazing skills. There are people that have come back speaking languages that they never knew before. That, I mean, just an insane amount of abilities, okay? So I consider this a gift. I'm also obsessively creative and I didn't know that I had epilepsy, like I said, for so long that since 1996, I've worked for several publishing companies, several individuals around the world ghostwriting and writing books and so since 1996 I have written 204 books I have either helped write or written from scratch the story the lore and sometimes the characters and the weaponry etc for 32 video games I have no idea how many articles I've written it is in the tens of thousands at this point and white pages and guides. I've had my my written work over game design and virtual character design used in U.S. patents over virtual character design. I've had my written work over game design used in college level textbooks over game design. I was a professional gamer for a while. create things. So right now, and this is kind of a digression real quick, right now I am struggling with business-wise. I have so much to do and I want to be there for my fans and I want to continue to make videos and so on. However, I get so busy that I have not been able to create. And so I, for my soul, have to balance my time where I can create art again, where I can create larger pieces again, where I can create these crazy ass shit things that I used to create. Now I do sigils. I've started doing synesthesia art, things like that, but this is different. This is on a whole other level. Okay. Anyway, I digress. Back to the story. So everybody comes back with gifts. I also came back with a lot of mediumship abilities. I think I was always kind of talented as a kid, but not 
got to this level. Like I could feel things. I could feel when I wasn't supposed to be somewhere. I mean, cause I grew up going to haunted locations, things like that. So I'm comfortable with that. But I grew up, I came back with an intense mediumship ability and I turned it off for a while because it scared me and because everybody was like, oh my God, this is fucking crazy. Don't talk about that shit, blah, 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 blah. I came back with several other gifts as well. I also came back with the knowledge of this. That there are people with these intense gifts that can see, know, etc. Things that are going to happen with someone's life. Especially me. If I read you, if I touch you, I, I we're, we're best friends suddenly. Like, I know almost everything about you. How your soul is. How your personality is. I may not know your whole life story. But how everything is. I gotta I hold your hand for a minute so when I travel and I do aura art and you can come to me and I will do aura art um, when I do that I hold your hand for a minute every time I shake someone's hand is a color if I hold your hand for a moment I take a deep breath and kind of draw the color the energy and it's layers of color that's what I draw well I found out after I'd been doing that for a few years that those layers I'm seeing and drawing actually coincide with the layers of the auric body aura auric body according to psychology i was like wait what the thing okay cool i'm not crazy that's what i do when i travel and like i said you can come to me and do that as well but there are people that know things and that are privy to information in the universe that they can never they can never tell people. And y'all, that is one of the shittiest motherfucking gifts to have. I cannot tell you the times that I've read people and I have seen things coming and I'm, I can't tell you good and bad. I can hint, but like I am not allowed to tell you. And I don't know how I know I'm not allowed, but I'm not allowed to tell you. I am not allowed to tell you. Y'all, it's dumb. My spiritual abilities physically hurt most of the time. I don't sleep well travel in my sleep. I see things. I know things. One of the other gifts I came back is with is this. And I actively try to be wrong every time. And by actively, I mean like, and I'll explain it in a minute. Okay. When I touch someone's hand, when I hug you, and like when we meet and I, my skin touches your skin, I know how long you're going to be in my path. Now, it may be, okay, several years, three years. I may not know to the day, but three years. Oh, that's just a wobbling like shit. Sorry, y'all. Y'all probably like, I'm going to throw up from all the wobbling. I know. And if it's like something like that where it's like three years and the end of that three years is coming, I know. I I know. So I start distancing myself because I kind of have to, right? Well, I'm not crying. I just had to take my sunglasses off for a minute. Y'all, it makes it stupid trying to date. It's like that Black Mirror episode where... They have the little thing, you know, they go on the date and they both have the little thing and they have to hit the button at the same time. And then, you know, they are told how long they're going to be with this person or that person or whatever. And they have to live in the house with that person, etc. And then when it's done, they say goodbye and leave. I have actively tried to be wrong every fucking time. Like, I've touched somebody's hand, and it been, like, three days. Okay? Let's just say three dates, okay? 
first, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to ghost you, and I'm going to be a shit, and I am not going to make plans with you. Like, uh-uh, not after that, after that first date. No. Nope. I'm going to actively try. No. I'm not even giving you three. No. I'll be motherfucking damned if we didn't end up running into each other somewhere. If we didn't end up, like, at the same place, like, an event or whatever, and then just, like, hanging out the whole night, and it's technically a date. Three times. And then I'm like, all right, all right, all right, bitch, okay, okay, I got you. Let's try this. I'm going to be the perfect woman. I'm going to, even beyond what I would normally, like, step out of me and be whatever I felt was the perfect woman for this person. Because like I said, at this point, I've hugged you, I've held your hand, I know you. after three dates even though they're like oh my god you literally are the perfect woman like how did I find you oh my god oh my god. you know like and then after three dates something happens and every time I trust my gut 100% my gut tells me to do something I do it even if I'm like what in the what? Why the fuck? What? I do it. I'm never wrong. It's dumb. It's dumb. It lets you know that you truly are on your own path by yourself. And it makes loneliness an intensive thing that it's almost broken me a couple of times I'm not gonna lie it's almost broken me a couple of times so be careful what gifts you ask for <laughs> be careful what gifts you ask for I know there were so many other things that I was like, we'll talk about that in a minute, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I feel like now we've gone over an hour and this is probably the time when you guys are like, okay, my mind hurts now, so you, I can't listen to this anymore. So, we're just going to go ahead and end this road rambling here. Plus, I'm actually almost home at this point. I've been jabbering my jaw off. I'm almost home at this point. So... We're going to end this road rambling and I will continue with another one later on. Know that I love you. I love your soul. I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. You are the prize, my friends. Don't forget that. See you next time.